they start with an idea in their head that they think is cool but has no real use cases doesn't solve any real problems and uh, i came at it from a very very different perspective where i'm always looking for a problem to solve and that's really the way to success in anything Hey, what's up guys? How is your day, your morning, your evening, your night? My name is Gray and this is another episode of the Gray Ave Podcast. I'm sure you can hear the excitement in my voice. Today we have an incredible guest. So this is the Gray Ave Podcast. If you're listening to this for the first time, this is a show where I interview those with skin in the game. By that, I mean those who are out in the world doing it and getting it done, the entrepreneurs. So today is no different. Um, We have an incredible CEO and founder. He had two successful startups at the beginning, and then he had 11 failed projects in a row. Uh, At one point, lost his apartment, but he weathered through the storm and ended up finding Paxfu. It's a long story, but you get to hear it in the podcast. And, you know, this kind of story is similar to what I heard from Peter Saddington in episode 63. Uh, I do recommend you check that out as well. So today, Paxfu is a peer-to-peer online Bitcoin platform that connects Bitcoin purchasers with sellers. Currently, the site offers over 300 ways to purchase Bitcoin, including credit card and debit cards. PayPal, Western Union transfers, and even Amazon gift cards. Ray has been an entrepreneur since 2001. As Napster was shut down, people were wondering if music could be profitable on the net again. Uh, The entire time, Ray was selling 30-second monophonic ringtones for $2. And that was five years before iTunes uh, was born. When MySpace and Friends were hot, and everyone was wondering how social networking would make money. Ray started the virtual gifts trend in social networking in 2004 and has been angel investing for the past decade. I personally got to learn a lot from this episode. I got very inspired uh, you know, by, the, by his story and what he has managed to, to achieve. So I hope someone out there you know, will also relate. If you're an entrepreneur right now going through some hardships, uh, which is common for a lot of entrepreneurs out there. That's what it really takes to, to get things done and, you know, uh, realize your dream. And not only that he is an entrepreneur, um, but he is also passionate about charity. So to quote Jillian Gotsu, who wrote an article about Ray on Medium, she says, there is a new class of money out there and the latest millionaires are not just buying Lamborghinis. They are building primary schools in Africa. So uh, Ray is well known for his hashtag built with Bitcoin. Uh, he has worked on a couple of projects in Africa, even, uh, you know, built schools and water wars and all the good stuff. So I recommend that you look him up uh, on social media and we talk about it in the podcast as well. He has a different uh, look at charity. Uh, he, he has his own thoughts about it, which is interesting to me. So yeah, I will let you guys enjoy my conversation with Ray. I hope you get inspired and get to do what you are trying to do out there. Where are you recording from? Where are you today? Uh, I'm in Estonia right now in Tallinn. This is where our uh, development and uh, product and support, part of our support team is. We have four offices around the world now though. Estonia, New York, uh, Hong Kong, and uh, Manila in the Philippines. Right, and I mean, if I read, if if my research was correct, you're from South Africa, though, right? Uh, where am I from? You mean? Yeah. Uh, where are you? I grew up in. From? Well, I grew up in New York, but I was uh, born in Egypt, so. Okay. So I'm African. Yeah. Not south though, north, northeast. Northeast. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. When, when did you move uh, to to New York? Well, I was two years old, so I didn't have much of a choice, but, you know, 
Well, my parents, my mom, <laughs> right. my father, and sister. So it's not like you can speak any Arabic at all? Uh, I can understand some of it in a very broken fashion, but uh, yeah, I have a long way to go before I get my <laughs> Arabic up to uh, you know, fluency here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's something I want to learn, definitely. I think it's a good language to know these days. Arabic, Russian, right. German. And but, and why did you choose to, to loan Paxful in, in Estonia? Well, I didn't really choose to do it. Uh, we first started in New York City. It was at New York, and we decided to try something together with Bitcoin because we loved Bitcoin, and we both really believed in the promise of Bitcoin to help you know people, real working people. And uh, it started working, and it started growing, and we needed help. And uh, Artur, my co-founder, is from Estonia, said, yeah, I know some really awesome people in Estonia, especially one guy who's a great developer, his name is Ivan, and uh, we became our third man, and it was a great decision because now we have over 30 people here in Estonia, and we built an amazing team here, and uh, I even married uh, an Estonian lady <laughs> six months ago, so uh, <laughs> it was a radical move. He told me, yeah, let's go to Estonia. Like, Estonia? Where the hell is Estonia? <laughs> is that right. where people get stoned? I don't know. I didn't know anything about Estonia, but it's a really nice place. And I went there because of Paxful, basically, and it was a great move. Awesome. So your your business history, was uh, was Paxful your first company? No, I've had many companies. I've had, like, I think Paxful might be my like, 14th startup, but I started, you know, I've, I've been in... Since 1999, I've kind of been in the startup game almost 20 years, and my first two startups were very, very successful. And uh, then I had kind of 11 failures in a row, <laughs> and now Pax was like the number 14, I guess, and uh, it's successful again. But yeah, I've been in the startup game a long time, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur, which basically means I'm unhirable. <laughs> But I have a lot of ideas, and uh, you know, crypto really just re-energized me and made me gave me a lot of hope again. And that's why I couldn't help it. I had to start something in crypto. I had to do something. Right. So I think we will have to revisit that part of you know entrepreneurship journey. You said this is your fortieth business. That's that's like you know, there's a lot yeah. of that. But let's just establish a few things. You know, you are an entrepreneur, obviously, and you're known for your charitable work as well. So if you meet someone at a dinner table, how do you introduce yourself these days? I just say, hey, I'm Ray, I'm from New York. What's up? That's pretty much it. <laughs> Nothing special. Uh, the, uh, I don't announce myself by my title or anything. I don't think the CEO title <laughs> means anything since I uh, do everything here. I've even mopped the floors here, right. <laughs> changed the water, <laughs> you know, when it gets uh, empty, and even the printer cartridges like everything right I'm just uh, I'm just an entrepreneur right but if it's uh, at the at a conference for example where you have to do some business uh, partnerships maybe how do you how do you introduce yourself in a business sense I'm Ray I'm co-founder of Paxful the peer-to-peer -peer marketplace and universal translator for money and we're making Bitcoin actually work for real people around the world right and now, before you get into your Bitcoin story, you said you've been uh, in the business since 1998, you said about that time? 99, yeah. 99, 99 yeah. So, what is, was your background like? Like, where did you go to school and what were your aspirations at the time? And what changed to actually make you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, well, I went to Baruch College in New York, which is kind of known like as Harvard for the poor. You know, it's like a place where a lot of poor Jewish boys went to school because they couldn't afford anything else, and now they're doing pretty well. They're CEOs, etc. And it's a city college, and it was very cheap. It was like two thousand bucks a month, I think. And uh, I majored in history <laughs> of all things, right? It's a school that known for its business and accounting, and I majored in history because I love the liberal arts, and I. I just couldn't imagine myself sitting there and doing everyone's taxes, right? Like everyone else, I was only, it was only me and one other guy that majored in history in Brook. So I'm kind of uh, a rebel and a contrarian from the start. But I got my first computer really late. I was 19 when I got my first computer. Wow. And I just taught myself how to code and I started building things. And uh, in 1999, I decided I got on my first startup and it was, uh, it didn't work. It was like Groupon using SMS. This was back when 
no one in the United States used SMS. And everyone's like, oh, no one's going to do that. I was actually working for a startup at the time that was trying, it was called Yada Yada. And that was my first job. And they were trying to do, uh, they were trying to basically make an iPhone with a Palm Pilot. So they were trying to, it was like a mobile ISP for Palm Pilots where you get a little modem and you can actually use the internet, a little Palm Pilot. And uh, I, I really loved the idea, but it just an execution, it was too early. So I decided to use the Groupon for SMS and that was too early. And I really couldn't sign up the retailers. And then I decided to pivot into ringtones of all things. And it started very simply when I needed, I heard some guy with the Mission Impossible ringtone on the old Nokia phones, you know, like, dan, 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 you know, monophonic. And I spent nine hours trying to get my first ringtone, right? And I went to this one forum and I found like this thread about ringtones, which was a 10,000 replies long. And after like, I don't know, a couple of hours of messing around, total like maybe half a day or something or more, I finally got the first ringtone on my phone. It was so hard. I was like, my God, why is that be so hard? So I basically built a website in 72 hours that let people uh, upload a ringtone with those little codes. They were called RTTL codes, which is actually just notes. You would upload it and then people could just have it sent to their phone via SMS. And I hacked everything so it could actually use send them SMS for free to the carrier's own websites. And uh, it was a total hack, but it worked. And it was super successful. I don't know if people think ringtones is kind of a joke, but it was extremely, it reminds me of crypto in a lot of ways in that uh, it was extremely uh, uh, lucrative. There was huge demand and there was a lot of scammers involved as well. And the biggest challenge I had in that business was the billing. Because if you think about it, it was all these young kids don't want ringtones, but they had no credit card. They had to right. take their parents' credit card, borrow it, and there'd be all these chargebacks. So every business I've ever started building has always been a huge issue. And uh, looking back on my life as an entrepreneur, all those successes, and especially those failures, those like 11 failures in a row, I couldn't have, couldn't have started Paxwell unless I had those experiences because they really taught me so much about what it takes to actually build a business, get through adversity, and listen to the user. And that's the most important thing, you know? Uh, so many people right now in crypto especially, they start with an idea in their head that they think is cool but has no real use cases, doesn't solve any real problems. And uh, I came at it from a very, very different perspective where I'm always looking for a problem to solve and that's really the way to success in anything. Right, that, that's very interesting story. I never knew that uh, the ringtone market was actually that big of a business. I just thought oh, it was it's massive. I thought it was more like for the cell phone manufacturers themselves. No, no, it's. Uh, I mean, the, it's an interesting business because when I started, it was really brutal. It's when Napster just went down, and I started the site called Matrix M, which is known as like the na the. Uh, the tower Records of ringtones, <laughs> people called it, right? And yeah. now Tower Records is out of business. It was more like a Netflix for ringtones, and uh, it was kind of, it was really tough because we were stuck between the music publishers and the uh, telcos, right? Two tough cookies to crack, right? The right. telcos didn't want to talk to you, and the music publishers were just looking to sue you for anything, right? So I had to build a business around that, and it was really tough, but I did it. I did it almost alone and uh, completely bootstrapped, but it was an incredible journey. I really learned a lot. I mean, uh, I thought I was going to be hailed as a hero as a young guy, 24 years old, and I came out with a way to get $2.50 to the music publishers for every single song. Just a 20-second little preview of a song. Right. And I thought they're going to be so happy. Oh, my God, they're, they're going to hail me as a hero here. Everyone's going to love this deal. And, and it doesn't cut into their existing business at all and actually might help promote their business. But I remember sitting in a boardroom with like all the biggest players, ASCAP, BMI, Harry Fox. And I'm like, yeah, guys, look. And then one of them gets up and like, well, this is nice, but uh, this is not how our business works. In our business, we get paid every single time the music is played. So oh, we want wow. to be paid every single time the ringtone goes <laughs> off. And I was like, I mean, I was like, oh, my God. So I spent the next four years just dealing with these guys, just trying to negotiate something and keep from being sued out of oblivion. And it was, it was rough, but I learned a lot. So was the end of that business the, the legal suits or it was just the time, just... Uh, the end of that business was really my own exhaustion. I kind of burned out like several times. I was spending like $40,000 a month on legal bills, you know, and I had to deal with these music, the, the whole music industry and the telcos, like these guys were the most savage. 
and I just couldn't take it anymore. I just wanted to be out of the whole tech scene, and I kind of went on a four-year sabbatical doing boxing and MMA, traveling the world, and it was only after my mother lost her house in a divorce, the house that I managed to buy her, that I said, okay, I, I got to come back into the business, and that's when I came back into the business. So that was my life journey. Right. I did. This was back when there was no entrepreneur culture or startup culture. If you told people you were an entrepreneur, they're like, "Oh, cool. When are you going to get a job?" <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Now it's a lot different. Now, eh? It's like it's pretty much the cool thing to do for a lot of people. It's yeah, more, exactly. It's more like a trend almost. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the, the, the old school entrepreneurs who've been through it, they know it's like it just hell. It just hell. You know, like <laughs> you want to be an entrepreneur, right. really? All right, you know. But uh, you know, I thought I was, you know, the jam because I had two successful startups. Like, oh, everything I touched is going to turn to gold. And then I had eleven failures in a row, right? Mm -hmm. And really taught me a lot about what it takes to really succeed and build a team. So I think let's let's look into that now. I think the way people start businesses right now is a little different. Uh, because you know they they're more likely to, to come straight out of university or they just dropped out or more likely they were on a nine to five job in, in corporate and then they want to step out and start their own businesses so or they were freelancers in a certain trade maybe they, if they were a developer or a designer or whatever they were doing but now when it's time to scale up. You know, it it would work for you to become to be a developer and work on multiple projects and get paid. But if you want to scale and build an app or something that you want to do, like a real business, I think it's a very very difficult stage for a lot of people to scale up to see the reality of taking their own cash and paying someone and all the bills. I don't know how long did it take you to actually break that mindset of being you know just like a solopreneur or others would call it to someone who is willing to to be paying up bills for for the company to run it's a great question it took me far too long to learn the power of delegation and to learn to just get going to learn that it, it's it's not about doing the work it's about building the team that's your job as a leader and that's how you have to see yourself and see everyone that you bring into the team you have to build a team of leaders right and that was very hard for me to do because i was just the type of guy that would do everything myself like i was mm -hmm. doing 72 hour coding marathons and i would just didn't want to delegate anything and it's a hard lesson to learn but after you've failed 11 times you begin to realize okay if I keep doing things again the same way, then I'm completely insane. Let me try something else. And then I just I just became all about the team. But it didn't happen magically overnight. You know, it's just something that you have to learn. And the more stubborn you are, the more type A or type T you are, the longer it's going to take. But when it happens, it's definitely worth it. So I just encourage everyone to go through it and just be about the team. Be only about the team. The team is what's going to take you to everything. And on, on moments when you're not sure how you could possibly afford a team, for example, I mean paying off a team in a long period of, uh, period of time, say you have maybe, you have targets and some clients that you might have already or you're aiming to get and those deals don't fall through, it's like, have you ever been in those situations within your host, or your startups? I mean, yeah, every startup I've ever had has been completely bootstrapped, right? We never right. took a dime from anyone, including Paxful, like it's just been completely bootstrapped. So it's like a relationship, you know, you know, you're, you're going to meet a great, say you meet a great girl and you really like her and she likes you, but you're broke, right? And maybe she's, she's from a rich family or something, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to overcome that, right? You have to convince people about the mission. It's not just about, okay, let's do something and make some money. It's too hard for most people to get into that. But I got very lucky because my co-founder right now, Artur, Artur Schaubach, this guy's brilliant. He's, uh, you know, he's ballsy as hell. Like, he'll just do it. And he, he me and him sat down and he built the entire thing. Artur quoted almost entirely himself from scratch. I'm a developer too, so I helped him. And, and that's what it comes down to. There's no magic formula there. You just have to invest the time. Like, I, I would, I hung out with a guy and one and then dined him for like, months and we really got to know and trust each other and that trust especially between co-founders is essential so there's no magic formula there you just have to take the time and you have to have a mission that you both believe in if you have some clients and you think you can make some money off of this okay cool then you can meet someone that will be that wants to do the same thing and you can get into it like that but really if you're going to do something magical if you're going to change the world 
you have to be united by a mission, right? And even if the business model you have doesn't like didn't find the product market fit, and in the beginning, uh, Artur and I didn't start back, so we started something called Easy Bits, which is a way for uh, retail merchants to accept Bitcoin because we wanted to increase the the size of the Bitcoin community. The mm -hmm. um, yeah, we we started something that didn't work, and uh, we had to pivot to something else. A friend of mine came to me and told me, "Hey, Ray." And by the way, at this time, I was actually homeless in New York. Oh was, wow! Uh, Arthur, yeah, our tour was. He came to New York from Estonia, a European you know, citizen, and he was trying to get the residency. And then he lost his place to live, and I managed to get him a place to crash with my best friend. Then I lost my place to live. And I didn't tell anyone at the time because I didn't want my mother to find out. But she would have been like heartbroken if she found out. And I just couldn't handle that with all the stress that was on me at the time. So I kind of just kind of hung out outside for a couple of days when I couldn't find a friend to crash with. And a friend of mine um, came to me and said, hey, you, you know you can um, make 100% profit selling Bitcoin for gift cards. I was like, really? What? what? I didn't believe it. But I tried it. I was desperate, and it worked. And we were like, wow, this is amazing. And then me and Artur said, hey, let's let's just build a business around this because we scaled it up and we were okay now. Let's like let's get all our friends into this. Let's make a thing out of this. And we did. And it turns out that uh, gift cards are actually the best way to onboard the unbanked. Right. People that don't have bank accounts, including the United States, our first use case was actually the unbanked in the United States. We didn't even know this population of people existed, right? And one day we just, you know, we built up Paxful and it worked. And then one day we got a call uh, on my phone. I put my personal cell phone on the website. It was the mm. first call. This poor lady, she was uh, desperate and she was screaming, I'm down to my last $13 and I need this Biggie Con. I was like, Biggie Con? You need this cool one. Bit of cool. You know, they, they, she didn't even know what it was, but she needed to post up this ad online. And she only had a smartphone. She only had cash. And I had to figure out how to get this woman some Bitcoin. She had spent the last eight hours online getting the runaround from Coinbase and everyone else. Without a bank account, going to buy Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. But I finally figured out, okay, let's, you can go to a drugstore and buy a gift card for cash at any drugstore in America. I would just go do that. And I found people that would take her gift card, process it, and boom, she got her Bitcoin. I taught her how to use Bitcoin. And then I took her input. And the input from, I did this for six months. I was actually on the phone with like all these people, like normal working class people that were just trying to get big. Explain the whole process to them. Like literally the whole process. And I want people to understand this, because this is super important as an entrepreneur. You do not know your product until you've seen your product from the eyes of your user, right? Right. I don't mean the power user, I mean the normal, everyday working class user. Imagine being on the phone with a single mother, she's four years old, she just has barely a smartphone internet connection sucks she's, it's just on your website and you have to teach her how to copy and paste the bitcoin address yes and send bitcoin and all these decimals and like this the bitcoin address looks like a password from hell copying and pasting on an android is that i mean like imagine that process step by step you know, no one else was willing to do that i remember other bitcoin websites just hung up on these people didn't even like accept their orders and shut them out but i was on the phone with them every day and I really like just said, okay, I'm not going to look down on these people. They might not be tech or crypto geniuses, but they are customers or human beings and they need help. And I just sat with them there and we redid the entire platform to, to help those kinds of people from their perspective. And it was invaluable because that's what got us our product market fit. And that is everything in startups. That is everything in tech. So do you think then when you're ready to start, it is it money first or the idea first? It's like, which one would you rather start with? It's the problem. The problem. It's not money, the idea, it's a problem. You, don't, you never start with an idea. If you start with an idea, where is this idea coming from? If this idea is coming from you as a user and a problem that you have, then yes, it works. But if you just have an idea, oh yeah, I'd like to maybe make a gastro coin token for my digestive tract. I think that would be awesome, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how many uses Castro coin would have. But if you make a product based on a real problem that people have, the problem that you might have, then you have a real chance for success there and a real chance of getting a product market fit. So everything has to start from a problem. Right. So before we get into your charitable work, let's just cover a little bit of how you got into Bitcoin. Uh, what was your first encounter and what were 
your thoughts around the time and what you well, thought of it. Uh, yeah, well, I didn't, I mean, I didn't think of it at all. I just uh, kind of got introduced to it in several ways. And the first time I heard about it, I was like, oh, this is just nerd money. I don't know what the geeks are even doing now. And one guy told me, yeah, man, you should, you know, I was selling my motorcycles, so a really nice BMW, but I had to sell it because I was, you know, I was going to all these startups and I ran through my entire life savings and I sold my motorcycle and a little bit of it I put into Bitcoin, right? This was back when it was like eight bucks. Mm -hmm. Eight and, bucks? Uh, when it was eight bucks? Yeah, when it was eight bucks. <laughs> okay. I didn't wow. get much for the bike, even though it was a great bike, but I put a little in there and I started really researching it. And uh, I went to my first Bitcoin meetup in, uh, I think, 2013 in New York, and uh, that's where uh, I walked in, and uh, the organizer came right up to me, his name was Justin, he, he, it's called BitDevs, was the name of the meetup, and it's one of the best meetups in New York, or Bitcoin, or anywhere, and he came up to me and said, hey man, I want you to see this guy, and he introduced me to Arthur, Arthur Shabak, who was sitting there working on his app, and uh, we just hit it off from there, he was the first person I actually met in Bitcoin, and I first Bitcoin meetup, and years later I asked Justin, why did you introduce us? You know, because we were both the first person, that was his first Bitcoin meetup too, and uh, we both met each other there, and he said, well, you were the only two tall guys in the whole place, so I thought you might get along. <laughs> so that's basically how Pax will kind of begin, to be connected. Right, and with, over the years, you know, the, the price appreciated a lot. I don't know if that ever affected what you thought about it, and now considering it's still growing, a lot of people are getting into it, mostly for the speculative aspect of it, unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, I don't know. Um, but from, from your, you have been in it since it was eight bucks at this point. So what do you think about it now? Do you think it's overpriced or what do you think is going to be the future right here? Yeah, I don't really look at the price and Pax will, you know, we don't care about the price. And right. uh, I love bear markets. I built my first, you know, two successful startups in the dot-com bear market right after the bust. Mm -hmm. and those are times to build for people that really want to actually solve problems for people. And so I, I'm very happy that we're in this bear market actually because it's like it's killing off all this BS, like this whole ICO, you know, brouhaha and this rampant greed. That's not the reason for us to get involved in this. The reason for us to get involved, we'll share this, is because it, it has a real promise of helping the little guy, right. right? A real promise of helping the people that are invisible, like the woman who called me. Who was, I heard her children screaming in the background as she was calling me about this big coon, like it, you know, this poor lady was like, "This is the." I didn't hung up on her. I I listened to her, and this is the reason why Bitcoin is awesome because it can actually give these people an alternative. It can give them a global financial passport that's what we're turning Paxful into a global financial passport that puts everyone it doesn't matter if you're a single mother in new york or a, you know a bushman in in, in, in in wherever like zimbabwe or a single mother in venezuela or some even some rich oligarch somewhere wherever you are and if you're invisible if you don't have the means to interact with the golden circle of finance right. well here's Here's peer-to-peer -peer finance, and this is a big point because people like they ask me. Like I have a friend who works for the Wall Street Journal, he covers emerging markets, and uh, first time I met him, I like he wanted to talk, and I was like, cool. And he asked me a question. He said, every time we want to write about Bitcoin, we don't know what it's good for, <laughs> right? And I, at first, the Bitcoin, you know, maximalist in me was like, wait. Uh, you know, you can do anything with Bitcoin. Blah, blah, blah. You can go buy, you know, in Microsoft and Dell and in Newegg. And then I was like, wait a minute, he's right. You really can't do much with Bitcoin, and that's the truth. But with peer-to-peer -peer finance, which is like the umbrella above Bitcoin, you can do almost anything. You know, because Bitcoin is peer-to-peer cash, right? And that was the first building block of this peer-to-peer -peer financial revolution. And the second was this amazing community of people around that have Bitcoin and want to really like spread it and make it grow and, and use it. And the third component is services, peer-to-peer -peer platforms like Paxful, which are the plumbing that are building this sharing economy around, this building this peer-to-peer -peer financial revolution. So all that combined, we really have something where anything is possible. 100%. And for those who are like in this, <laughs> at this point in the market, for example, you know, uh, I think this is a very, sensitive market when it comes to the price somehow still and there are people that have good intentions 
but they're a little bit discouraged with uh, what's going on right now, you know, in terms of the future of what, what could happen to, you know, to Bitcoin or could not happen. What, what do you, what, what's your projection as far as the future in terms of where do you think this currency is going to sit? Do you think we're going to end up more, uh, at Bitcoin specifically, do you think it's going to end up as a commodity or as cash as it was intended to be? Yeah, well, this is a this is a huge point of uh, debate, right? And I don't have any fresh insight, but I can share my story. So I don't know if you heard, but we uh, got this sponsorship deal with Bitcoin.org, right? Yeah. And the deal fell through because the community was like, "Oh, this is favoritism content there." And the reason we wanted to do that is because, you know, we looked at uh, the stats for Bitcoin.com and Bitcoin.org, and Bitcoin.com is slaying it. They literally have double the traffic. It's growing like crazy. They're marketing like crazy. They're all about Bitcoin Cash. And we got into this is because all these poor people would start sending Bitcoin Cash to their Paxful addresses. They thought it was the same thing, and their money would, was lost. Right. And me and my co-founder had to sit there together in the middle of the night, a couple hours every night, and refund these people because we use Bitcoin. You know, we can't just. It's a process where both of us have to sit there and like you know share the keys and, and do that. And we got so pissed, it's like, wow, Bitcoin is being smothered here. Like, that. let's at least help. So we tried. You know, to do something to get the profile of Bitcoin up by doing the sponsorship deal, and again, it got shot down. And we were like, "What is going on here? You, this is a war against commerce. Like, someone doesn't want peer-to-peer -peer cash to work, right?" So, I'm not going to make any uh, remarks about that. But uh, the Bitcoin Cash community has a lot of the original spirit of Bitcoin, despite its flaws and despite the infighting, which is unfortunate. I can't make any prediction about Bitcoin specifically or the price. But I can't say you should not look at the price and you should not even, I mean, as much as I love Bitcoin and I am a maximalist at heart, it's about the peer to peer finance as a whole, right. right? Even if it's not Bitcoin that makes it on top, peer to peer finance will succeed because there right. will be some universal currency that actually you know, we can use. Because all Bitcoin is in peer to peer finance is like just a clearing layer. Any form of money can become any other form of money, and this cryptocurrency, this universal currency, is the clearing layer. For example, someone can put in an Amazon gift card code in California into Paxful, and then it can become Bitcoin, and then from there, the Bitcoin can become a Walmart gift card in New York, or a PayPal deposit in the UK, or cash in Cambodia, or a bank transfer in Australia. Any form of money can become anything else, and that is the magic. Forget the price. Forget. Bitcoin's relation to the U.S. dollar is that it's so complex. Right. You know, anyone that knows investing understands that. Like, look at gold and silver. What their prices stayed the same for so long. How? I mean, if you read, like, look at Paul Craig Roberts. He he's a brilliant dude. He used to be uh, President Reagan's uh, Secretary of Finance in the 90s and 80s, and he's the one that got America out of, out of the whole stagnation. And he basically tells the truth. He says, "Hey, they are artificially manipulating the price." of gold and silver every morning on the Forex. Why? To protect the reserve currency of the world. And if they can do this for a, a gold and silver, which is like how many trillions of dollars exist right. in gold and silver, it's a child's play for them to do this with Bitcoin, with a 200, you know, $250 billion economy. That's, <laughs> that's nothing. That's a joke. Like one guy can do that. Yeah. You know? One guy, literally. So. Forget about the price. If you're looking at the price, you're missing the whole point. And that's the only, uh, I'm sorry if it's kind of a letdown, but that's the only advice I have to give or projections I have to give. I really don't care what the price is. I'm just trying to solve problems and enable people across the world. That's it. Right. So uh, the first time that I came across your projects, uh, the charitable projects was through Anthem and Logan. Uh, and could you just give an overview of what you're doing to actually help a lot of people and in the name of Bitcoin, uh, which is awesome as well? Yeah, well, first, let me just uh, say that uh, guys like Anthem and Logan, uh, I don't know Logan that well, I met him like twice, I think, but I know Anthem pretty well, he's an amazing guy. And it's people like him that really made me uh, believe that this could work because there are so many good people in Bitcoin like him are just big hearted, brilliant, and really want to make a difference. I was like, wow, if we can mobilize all these awesome new people that, that have financial resources now, we could really change the world. And it's people like Anthem that made me think, wait a minute, this can actually happen right now. 
So it began to open me up to, to giving and, and like giving back and doing humanitarian works because for the longest time, and it's the truth, I didn't believe in any of this charity BS. I was like, oh man, these people are just spending money on parties. 95% of it goes to their administrative costs. Only 5% is going to go to help. I was like, I don't mind. It's just for like spoiled rich people. So I didn't believe in it. But then, you know, I, I met this dude, Yusuf Nasri. I actually found him through an Instagram video of an orphanage he built in Afghanistan for orphans. And, uh, an orphanage for orphans. <laughs> and it was such an awesome video. I had to call the guy up and uh, he was amazing. This guy works two part-time jobs just to uh, just to, to be able to do this and puts everything 100% towards the projects. I was like, wow, I, I got to help this guy out. And I did. And then finally, again, I found out he was building a, a, a school and he wanted to build a school in Africa, mm -hmm. in Rwanda, from another video he made uh, on Instagram. And he didn't even tell me about it. He was the guy that asked for anything. I was like, wow, dude, our biggest market is Africa. Our biggest market at this point is Nigeria and uh, Ghana. And I asked him about this project, hey, why don't you tell me about this? And it turns out Rwanda, I mean, when I heard about Rwanda, I was like, the only thing I know about Rwanda about is the genocide that happened 20 years ago. Yeah. And the more I researched Rwanda, I was like, wow, this is amazing. These people have uh, forgotten about this. They've forgiven all of this. There's no more revenge. They've this huge scar on this, these people that have been like, kind of wiped out and it's clean, it's safe, it's civilized. It's this very, very little corruption. I was like, this is amazing. Even though Paxton doesn't have a market in Rwanda, it doesn't matter. This is a place where you can help and the, the change will last. So I was like, hey, Paxton was going to help you do this. And then when we went there and saw what was being built and the children, it was a lot. I was like, yeah, wow, this is amazing. It began to grow. And we can actually, it's not just one school now. It's a template for these sustainable villages based on education all over the world. And Africa, Rwanda is just the start. You know, it's like, if you look at these schools that they're being built, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll share some more of these videos on social media later soon, uh, still kind of under the radar, but these schools are all built with full plumbing and water reclamation systems in there, where they collect all the rain wall, the fall on the school or the roofs of the schools, comes down into a tank, there it goes in, into a, a well, like a storage, so then it gets pumped up into a tank, and from there, it provides clean drinking water for the entire village, right? And it's that literally thousands of people that, that I can't overstate the importance of water because, I mean, it's it, it's just like this one young boy, I have him on a video, uh, I'll send it to you. He's just uh, right. thanked us so much. He's like, hey, I can finally go to school now. And then, like, when the school was built, this single mom came up to us and was like, she was so thankful she gave Yusuf two chickens, which is a lot for someone living there. And she, she was like, yeah, now I can finally, you know, work and, and make extra money for my family so I can put my kids in school. And I was like, well, really? You don't think about these things. Right. Like, but this is huge infrastructure. And now we've actually built solar power into those schools as well. So, when, like, basically, the nucleus of civilization is water, nursery school, primary school, power, and to top it all off, a hospital. If you can build that in a place, you will have civilization springing about and for me the big payoff is uh now that there's primary school kids coming in anywhere from six to 14 years old we can actually teach them things right we can teach them about things that i wish i got taught in school like proper nutrition how to handle your money yeah right? <laughs> i wish someone taught me those two things growing up you know when i was like a poor fat kid that didn't know anything right have you ever been a, a poor fat kid before i been, yeah, I grew up for a fact kid, that's what I was, man. Wow. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but mm -hmm. now we have the, you know, we have the ability to actually, like, help people, like, give them the knowledge that as you start, so it's kind of turned into, like, the Stim City for me right now or something like that, like, we can actually build up communities around the world, and it's not just Africa, Africa's just the start, because, you know, I, mm -hmm. I have a soft spot for Africa. I really do believe Africa can be a superpower. You know, this project Wakanda, that's one of the reasons why I like Rwanda. <laughs> Wakanda, Wakanda, Rwanda. Rwanda. Wakanda, Rwanda. <laughs> yeah, it even sounds like it. I mean, the, it, you know, there's there's a lot that we can do, and now we have the resources to do it. So why not? Who else is going to do it? Because I hear all these people talking about how they're going to, you know, build this in Africa and do that. But, you know, like I asked the guy, uh, He's working with use of social good as an mm -hmm. and I asked him, what else is going on in Africa? Because I hear about Akon and Leonardo DiCaprio and he's like, well, yeah, we talked to all those people 
But when it comes down to actually put down the money, none of them do it. <coughs> yes. Just talk. And I was like, all right. So, yeah, we built two little schools for a thousand kids, but at least we did it, you know, and it's the start of something good. So I really am proud of that. And it's something that we can all do. And Anthem is awesome. He actually built a couple of wells there himself, and that's the start of something epic. So this is only the beginning. We're calling the initiative Built with Bitcoin. It's about building things, things that are going to last like hundreds of years, even after we're gone, right? And the more we build, and especially focus on education and young people, epic things can happen, dude. It's just the start. And I really, really believe in this. You know, this is not just talk. I'm not just some rich, fat old guy that's going to charity dinners here. You know, it's something real that we can all do. Yes. We don't have to ask permission from anyone. 100%, yeah. Uh, and. I mean, what I like about this also is like if somebody had to go for a crowdfunding approach, it's easier to do at a world scale because it's Bitcoin or you know, it's cryptocurrency. So you don't really need uh, banking infrastructure to raise funds even, which is great. But for a lot of people who want to get started or they would want to participate in a charitable organization or in a movement like this, but they don't really have the fire to start it themselves and they would just want to join something that's already existing, like yours. How would they participate? Well, I encourage everyone to donate directly to Zamzam Water. They take all forms of cryptocurrency right now. So if you yeah. have some capital and you want to put it towards something awesome, something you can see, like a school, that's the perfect way to do it. Uh, we are growing the network. Like It's all about people like you know, a use of nursery of Samsung water, people that you can trust, people that you know are actually going to execute. And the more we find those people all around the world, and they are coming to us now, there's people that contact me about projects in Southeast Asia, more popular projects in Africa, like Uganda, mm -hmm. even in Venezuela, we're doing food drives there for young people and the elderly as well. This is happening, and uh, I will personally vouch for these people, you know, once I find them, and they'll all become a part of this initiative. and. There's no, um, there's no like, so everyone, like even the CEO, the CEO of Binance uh, was saying, hey, was asking, hey, if someone figures out a way to bring real transparency to charity and make sure it's all legit on the blockchain, I'll invest. And I'm like, yeah, that's great, but there's no way technology alone can bring like, transparency. It's all about the people that are doing it. You know, there's no shortcut there. You have to know the people. You have to build those relationships. You have to trust and verify, and that's what it comes down to. So just you just have to jump into it. You know, a lot of people don't have a lot of time, but if you have money, that's great. If you just have time and no money, contact Yusuf, contact him. You know, something you can definitely do. Like I went to that village and me and my boys were digging one of the wells. Right. <laughs> so there's there's a lot that can happen, but uh, you know, please be patient with us. We're just figuring this out right now. I've never had to. Built. I mean, the only time I ever built anything was I helped rebuild the school in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina you know, with five nuns. And that was awesome because it was the first school that actually went up and allowed people to come back into the city. Like, you, you don't know how important schools are uh, until that because there's no way the police and local fire departments will come back into a disaster area unless they can put their kids in school, right? So it really is the foundation of civilization. And we're just getting started. But just join us, even if you don't have capital even if you don't have enough time we can we can find something we can figure it out it's just started right. i wish i had a better answer than that but this is the truth <laughs> right man i appreciate it uh, i appreciate your time thanks so much um this was great thank you great it's great talking to you great finally meet you awesome well, uh let's do this again sometime absolutely hit me up anytime brother thank you so much Hello once again and that was the end of our conversation and just before you go just want to communicate a few things with you uh, quickly if you have uh, enjoyed any of the podcast or this specific podcast episode I would appreciate it if you share it with your friends and family through your social media Twitter Facebook etc etc as well as write me a five-star review on iTunes or Apple podcast app that would be fantastic. It helps me flourish and sustain this podcast as well. Uh, we also on other platforms like SoundCloud, uh, Stitcher Radio, um, and all other major podcast platforms. So whichever way you're listening to it, I would appreciate it if you leave me a review. You can also subscribe to the Grey Podcast through my website, greyjabesi.com, G-R-E-Y-J-A-B-E-S-I.com. There you also find some of the blogs that I'm writing.
sometimes and you get notified as soon as the new episode has been published. Until next time, enjoy and be productive. Thank you.